is there a frequency of ejaculation that is too much that if if a guy is say ejaculating every single day is that insufficient to get a complete replenishment where if he's having infertility you would say you yes. got to move it to every other day or yes. whatever the number is so that's a, a great extrapolation of the pot of the pot of soup idea and so on that note i would say typically we recommend every 2 days of two days of abstinence between sex every other day is it to optimize for, right but not for the semen analysis that's for conception okay because uh, depends on how old you are in your biology but most men need a day or two to refill to to recharge completely a day or two so that's that's why we do it that that's why we recommend that that's sort of a generalization some men are fine every day right? okay i had a guy uh once who had to bank sperm for hepatitis treatment and he was looked like Mickey Rourke and had a wooden leg and he's about 50. And I said, you're going to need to abstain for a couple, couple, three days to do this semen analysis. So we get a good stamp. I want it to be, you know, an optimized one. And he looked at his partner and he goes, and she looked at me, she goes, he grabs, he, she grabs him and says, he can't do that. He's every day. He can't do that. I don't know what he's going to do. So he's like, he was panicking that he had to hold off for day. Just like, I was like, I said, often do you have sex? He said, twice a day, every day. I'm like, okay. So that was, uh, that was great. And then I had one man, wonderful orthopedic surgeon at Stanford. And I asked him on my questionnaire, I said, how often do you have sex? And he wrote 0. 0.00013565. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant, he divided once a year. <laughs> well, point zero zero weekly. Well, point zero zero one five for like you know Avogadro's number, right? And I'm like. Which meant he was so frustrated that he, <laughs> it, was, it was a beautiful way to say that. It was the point zero zero one three five five. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the um, yeah. So that's so there for a semen analysis for diagnostics for infertility. When you when you abstain longer, your sperm count will rise, but your motility will fall because it's older. So there's a you know there's a, the there's two a, there's a min max curve that you're optimizing for, right. which you would say is three days would be about right. When you're not going to gain that much, you're not going to lose that much motility. After that, it starts going. So there's sort of biological variability, which we try to minimize when we do the semen analysis. So two to four days of abstinence. That's a different period than what we're recommending for sex, which is every other day. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the New England Journal paper where you looked at, they looked at, um, I think, 700 couples and they had them keep diaries. It was a Boston based paper, keep diaries of how they uh, had sex, when they ovulated, and when they got pregnant. And then they said, do what you normally do and then give us the diaries. And then they evaluated them and they found that having sex, say ovulation is day 15 of the cycle. Um, when they started having sex on 9, 11, 13, there were significant pregnancy rates and the, every other day was the optimal interval. But even five days before and three days before, there were substantial pregnancy rates before ovulation. But if you waited to ovulation and then had sex, that's about 20% of conception. So when you get the kit, don't react to it, predict in front of it. So front load the sex. Very important point. And why is that? Is that because there's a reservoir effect in this uterus? It's managed sperm will survive for a day or two. So when men how, are under stress, if ovulation is day fifteen, how could a day eleven sperm survive four days? Does it's nurtured once it's past the vagina? But how many of them are surviving? Uh -huh. Is it literally the lone wolf, or Probably. is it the last hundred? Maybe some of the sperm bind to the oviduct and wait. Where is, remind me where the oviduct so is. So the uterus and there's yeah. the fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes. And it, that's the, the oviduct. And the, the oviduct is right below that, the, where that's the, the fallopian sit. tube essentially. Yeah, yeah. They, they bind to the endothelium and just park. If there's no egg, they'll just sit there and they'll So bind. again, going back to our moon analogy, this is <laughs> after you've done stage one, stage two, stage three, you're now out of gravity. Right, like it's actually not an energetics problem anymore. Right, or, or not fight death, or death yeah, yeah, star yeah, yeah. problem. Right, that's right. You've escaped the hostile environment. Right. Of, in this case of gravity, so now it's a fun place. It's the right pH. It's warm. So, so, so do we have a amazing. sense? This would be a g very interesting experiment of um, what is the longest duration that a sperm could survive for conception. In other words, you, to do the experiment, let's just make it as a thought experiment. You had, you know, a large number of women that you knew were going to ovulate on day 15, and then you would have them, you know, have 
intercourse on day seven, eight, nine, ten, mm -hmm. and you create a histoplot or a distribution of what's the frequency of pregnancy across those things and kind of ask like, what's the bottom fifth percentile, which is the theoretical yeah, possibility. Yeah, okay. that's a good one. Yeah. And then the same thing after, right? You want to develop right. the oh, bell yeah. curve of the whole well, thing. Well, we know that once the egg is ovulated of about eight hours and then it's over. Oh, this is a not, very important point. It really needs to be front. If it's only eight hours of survival, right. this is- After ovulation, about eight hours, it's dead if it's not- This is a very, very left tail curve. Correct. Ah, I did not know that. So okay. you want the sperm there ahead of time. So 80% of conceptions naturally or at home occur when sex is front loaded as opposed to reacting to ovulation. And most of the apps that are available nowadays will tell you that. Peter, you're drawing a graph. I am. I, I, I have to draw. And it looks like it's algebraic. <laughs> this is incredible. Okay. Yeah. Just this is, it's easier for me to think about these things graphically. Um, and, and to think that it basically shuts off at about eight hours. So I give some, some more physiology. I, um, there was a study that showed how long it took to make a sperm. And it was published in science, I think in the sixties. And they gave men, uh, tritiated water. They gave men, yeah. They gave men radioactive hydrogen, treated yep. water, yeah. and then they biopsied their testicles, which would never be done nowadays. But I did it a little different. I gave deuterated water with a, a, a with a, a group at Berkeley, and we gave healthy men uh, deuterated water for a week, and and then we checked the first. Sorry, dumb question. Why didn't they just measure the ejaculate? Why did they have to biopsy? The, the I'm not testes. Sure. Why did they, they just want to know about spermatogenesis? But we didn't want yeah, to bother. They actually testes. wanted to torture the guys, but and they weren't. I don't know what. That, well, that's wild. But that was the best data, and we yep. did deuterated water, which is not radioactive, and we could measure that. So we gave them a, a dose, and then we watched their ejaculates weekly. Yep. And we looked for when deuterated the hydrogen showed up in the in the in the DNA, and it was an average of seventy four days. So normally, say three months to make a sperm. So some men were 42 days, and that's making, that's going through the epididymis and getting ejaculated. So that's, a you know, some, so we talked about maybe two months in the testis and two weeks, a week or two in the epididymis, and then maybe a couple of weeks to ejaculate. And this was all the average 74 days. So it actually changed the timeline enormously to a much faster one. Hmm. That uh, so seventy four days. So when you do anything to a man, fertility wise, you you're not going to expect to see anything change for at least two and a half months. And when you talk about full replacement of that semen, it's probably it's probably end up being ninety days when it's all replaced. The pot is replaced. Yep. So okay. that, that's a limitation of what we do because forty two year old women want now, and we have three to six months. When I did a study on fixing varicose seals, which is an infertility problem in men, it's surgery. And I looked at the mean time to conception. It was about seven months after repair, which is two cycles of sperm production. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.